Hey guys, it's Dr. McGlasson. We are getting to the end of the Section 5 material on fiscal policy, and I've kind of taken the Wayback Machine to 1992 on this one. Another election year where um, Bill Clinton got elected into office. He was running against George W. Bush Sr., former CIA head, and he won. And a lot of people think that the reason that he won is because Ross Perot ran as a third party in that particular election. And took 20% of the vote. So one in five people who voted, voted for Ross Perot, which meant that once Bill Clinton got into office, then he and the new Republican Congress started saying, huh, one in five voters cared about the stuff this guy was talking about, which was the deficit and the debt. Maybe we should do something about it. As a side note, not unlike Bernie Sanders in the last 2016 election, um, Political wisdom has it that if Ross Perot had not been in, George Bush Sr. probably would have won that election. We might have had a very different 1990s. Who knows? So anyway, back on track. I'm going to let me get myself out of the way here. So if I take a look at some of the data from 1992, which is what I've been trying to get you to do for each of these, is look at the data and say, what are the macroeconomic goals and which ones should we be concerned with? If I take a look, and I have a sheet here, but I'll put these up on the screen, uh, GDP, $9.3 trillion in 1992, growth 3.5%. Inflation 3% and unemployment at 7.5%. So, you know, by our standards right now, 3.5% is pretty decent growth for us. Inflation's 3%, which is higher than we've been seeing, but in the safe range, that CIA factbook range of 1% to 4% for developed countries. Um, but the unemployment was at 7.5%, which seems a little high given where we are right now. And we had just come off of a recession, that 1991-92 recession that we talked about a little earlier in the semester, where we had gone into Kuwait in August 1990, and people got nervous about it, and they stopped spending their money, and then we had recession. So you'd kind of been, be thinking that they'd be in an expansionary frame of mind, but in fact, because of Ross Perot and him kind of bellyaching about <laughs> the deficit and the debt, not that I have a problem with that, um, he got people's attention, and he got the president, this newly minted president and Congress, attention as well. So the first thing they did early in 93, when they all got into their new offices, was had a deficit reduction package, which, as it sounds, is going to slow the economy. It's going to be uh, contractionary. And you kind of wonder, with unemployment at 7.5%, why, why do I want to do this? Why do I want to slow the economy? I might make unemployment worse. And the wisdom was that we could make the economy healthier in the long run. So it's a little like um, I ran up too much credit card debt and I have to pay it off. So I'm going to have to take some pain for a little while to make my financial health better for the long term. So what they did was increased income taxes on the wealthiest group, which means you're going to see a decrease in spending by the households. And then I don't think this says anything about the investment spending part so much. Uh, but it does say big cut in government spending, decreased government spending, and then not really talking about the foreign sector. So that's probably going to be constant. So what I'm seeing is two components here, probably constant, but consumption spending falling, government spending falling, spending means aggregate demand, not aggregate supply. So decrease in the aggregate demand, which means aggregate demand is shifting to the left. And what I would expect to see then is going to be it would have downward pressure on prices and would also have downward pressure on the GDP, okay? which seems, again, counterintuitive. They said the goal was to reduce the size of the deficit and to bring the economy out of recession. But in fact, they're decreasing the GDP. But you know, it's a long-term health thing. I'm going to skip over for a second and show you something. Okay, if you were to Google the U.S. debt clock, you would come 
up with this same site that I'm on right now. And this is our current numbers showing our US national debt. And it's kind of creepy and mesmerizing <laughs> if you watch it because it just keeps going up and up and up. And in fact, even if we didn't spend another penny, if we did not increase our deficit at all, this would keep going up and up and up. And part of the reason, as you saw in the taxes video, is we've got interest payments on our debt. So the bigger the debt, which currently is at $24 trillion, the bigger the debt, the more more interest payments we have. So this is going to keep going up no matter what. So like I said, it's kind of like we ran up a really big credit card bill and if we could get it under control more, then we aren't going to have those extra payments because we actually pay more in interest on the debt than we pay for, you know, things like research and development and science and that kind of stuff. So that's why in spite of the fact that uh, it could cause some short-term pain here. I could see GDP decreasing. They figured if we can get this under control, get the deficit under control, get the debt down, then in the long term, we're going to be better off. Okay. But then the next thing that they did was went their separate ways. So they were in agreement briefly when they came into office. And then the very next thing was, oh, well, we have our own ideas about plans. So once they had put that deficit reduction package in place, then the Republicans and Clinton kind of went their separate ways and said, hey, we have our own ideas about what the good plans are for the future of this economy. And they were both expansionary. This includes the Clinton plan. The Clinton plan included investment tax credits. Well, if I've got investment tax credits for businesses, again, let me set up my consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports and see what's going to happen, at least on the spending side. Investment tax credits. Well, that means investment goes up. I'm giving them incentives to invest more in their businesses. Tax deductions for research and development. So it'll be more spending on research and development, which again is typically a business investment kind of thing. Increased government spending on infrastructure. We hear a lot about that. Increased spending on education, also government spending. The goal is to increase production. So what I'm clearly seeing here is increased spending, increased spending. It didn't say anything about households or foreigners. But, you know, this increased spending is going to bring the oh, very crooked line aggregate demand to the right. OK, so aggregate demand is increased. But that's not all, because where was it? They were making very targeted sorts of moves here with this, that they targeted specific tax credits for businesses investing. Well, more business investment today means more production tomorrow. Tax deductions for research and development. Well, better research and development today means more production tomorrow. And increased government spending on infrastructure, telecommunications, communications, that means more productivity tomorrow. So if all those things are productivity enhancing, I'm also going to see an increase in the aggregate supply. Okay, so I would see my aggregate supply shift to the right as well. This is getting messy. Uh, I would have, you know, the way that I've drawn it, they're not perfectly stable, but you know, pretty stable prices. They're a little bit higher in my graph than they were before. And I am going to have greater GDP, right? Goods and services increasing in production. I get my growth. With the growth, I'm going to see decreases in unemployment. So I get everything that I wanted. I say that the prices stayed fairly stable. I get my growth, my higher GDP, and I get my lower unemployment. So that dream package, if you will, the combination of things that you want can be gotten through manipulating the demand and supply so that they are both increasing. If the aggregate demand and aggregate supply both shift to the right, the prices remain stable, you get the growth, you get more jobs, so you get the unemployment coming down. Which leaves me with question number three, the Republican contract with America. Again, I mean, just see what's going on here. Consumption, investment, government spending, net exports. The contract with America said large reductions in federal spending except for defense and social security. So they're trying to cut government spending. Elimination of federal regulations. Well, regulations on whom? These are regulations on businesses. And if you decrease the regulations on businesses, it's going to be easier for them to produce. And I'm actually going to see an increase in aggregate supply if I take away regulations on businesses. So aggregate supply is going to shift to the right. So I'll have a new aggregate supply aggregate supply too. And a cut in the income tax means that I'm going to have more spending on the part of the consumers. The goal is to increase production. So now I have one of these little bit confusing because I have 
consumption going up, but I have government spending dropping. So what's the net effect going to be? Well, remember, in the absence of any actual numbers, consumers, households do two-thirds of all the spending. They're about 70% of our GDP. So if I'm a guessing person, and they said cutting some areas of government and increasing other areas of government, but even barring that, if I'm a guessing person, I'm going to go the way that the households go. The households are increasing consumption. So household spending's up, government spending down, but I would say overall, you end up with increased aggregate demand. So aggregate demand shifts to the right. I have aggregate demand too. I have a new equilibrium. And again, the way that I've drawn it, because I'm not doing the best job here, is a little bit higher, not too much higher. You get fairly stable prices. For the most part, you guys will probably see that your price is about equal to where it was originally if you're shifting these two things equally. And then my GDP is quite a bit higher than it was before. So I get my growth and I get my decrease in unemployment. I'm producing more goods and services. I've got more jobs, decrease in unemployment, okay? Brings me to the bottom here. The follow-up questions. Is the Clinton plan based on classical or Keynesian theory and why? Is the contract based on classical or Keynesian theory and why? Now this is interesting because we said that when the government's getting hands-on, that tends to be Keynesian. And so I'm getting a lot of people saying, well, these are both Keynesian. Okay, the Clinton package, definitely Keynesian. Democrats tend to be more on the Keynesian side because they're very directed. Um, they have tax credits, but it's very specific directed tax credits. So they're really getting there and micromanage what's going on with the economy. So these very targeted tax credits, specific tax deductions, directed spending by the government. So they're getting the government more involved. And if you increase the level of the government involvement, then that points you to Keynesian, right? more government involvement, more hands-on. Um, contract with America based on classical or Keynesian. It's actually classical. You say, but they had active policy here, but look what the policy is doing. It's reducing government spending. So taking the government out of lots of programs and taking away federal regulations on businesses. So removing the government from the production side. So what they're trying to do is decrease the level of government involvement, which means classical, right? If there's less involvement, that's classical. So it goes back to the point that I made in class earlier in the semester. People often think, well, Democrats are liberals because they have liberal social views and Republicans are conservative because they have conservative social votes. When you say liberal and conservative, it is liberal use of government, that they are very hands-on. And when you say conservative, it's very conservative use of government. They only use it when they need to. So uh, the level of involvement in the economy is actually what leads you to that liberal or conservative. And the liberal use of government is Keynesian. The conservative use of government is classical. So that's the Clintonomics, except maybe with one more thing. Just to make the point that, remember the data that I showed you earlier where I said you would be a little bit surprised um, to see that if they were worried about a recession that they would have contractionary policy? Well, it's because what I'm going to target is a normative question. When I look at this data, do I want to target that unemployment rate, that seems like it's too high. Well, too high is subjective, it's a normative thing. So you might find one group of people says, hey, it's the unemployment rate that needs to be targeted. And this particular group, at least, having followed on the heels of Ross Perot said, no, 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 it is the deficit that we need to take care of. So I'm not going to know what's the appropriate policy, expansionary or contractionary, until I have an idea which piece of the economy that I'm going to target. So that's typically a most missed question on quiz number five, is I will present you with some data of an economy and say, hey, which of these things are we going to deal with? And you don't know that's a normative question. If I just give you the data and you don't know what's going to be targeted, you can't tell whether it's expansionary or contractionary policy that's going to be appropriate. In this case, when they first said, hey, let's target the deficit, it was contractionary. Then when they said, let's target the recession, get more output, get more jobs, then it's expansionary. So if I just give you some data, you won't know, 
Should I use expansionary or contractionary? If I give you some data and say the government wants to target the inflation rate or they want to target the unemployment rate, so if I tell you what they want to fix, then you can tell me expansionary or contractionary. So keep that in mind when you're going through quiz number five, and I will uh, probably be posting again soon.